As you may or may not know, we have what we think is a crisis, mental health crisis. First of all, in the world, the World Health Organization is projecting that in some years, depression will be the biggest, one of the biggest health concerns in the world. It's turning in to be one of the biggest problems right now. And in Norway, I don't know how many of you watched uh, Folkopplysningen, Syk, the new uh, Ungdata statistics suggesting that today's youth, they drink less, they have less sex, but they have more mental health problems. And thirdly, in academia. There are various statistics in various studies, but the concern is that you guys in this room are in a risk group because you have your profession and people are wondering, maybe the prevalence of these disorders are higher in populations like yours. So uh, I think these are, whether or not it, it's true, if we have a crisis or not, I think it's definitely room for concern. And I think this is a good place to start. Let's have a chat about this. What kind of problems are we having right now and what can we do about them? Because as Yashwan said, I work, I'm actually a psychologist. Uh, I'm a sports psychologist. I usually say sports psychologist because I've worked mainly with athletes. But I'm actually a clinical psychologist by training. I've taken the, the clinical psychology program here in Norway, so I'm actually a psychologist. And that's going to be my most relevant role here. I'm going to be speaking to you guys mostly as a clinical psychologist, actually, before I turn to the more performance side of things, if we're going to see what can we actually do about the problems that we may or may not have. I'm also a PhD fellow, but my PhD has nothing to do with the talk today. And I'm not going to assume you're going to be inspired by my PhD because it's probably totally different from yours. So I'm going to be speaking as a psychologist and I'm going to first go into what are the most common mental issues and then we're going to have a look what can we do with a special emphasis on us in academia because I think our context is a bit unique in certain ways. So that's the plan for today. So first of all, mental issues, what does that mean in Norway? Well, it usually, overall, it tends to mean two things, and that's depression and or anxiety. If you have one, there's a really good chance you'll have the other for some reason. Researchers are looking into this. There are various mechanics, the hypotheses of why these tend to come together, but they do tend to come together. And it's at least 25% in the population will at some point have clinical depression or anxiety, at least. And some figures are up towards 50%. And you'll, you'll probably either have it or someone really close to you will have one of these. And the most common symptoms in uh, depression um, are lowered energy, lowered interest in the stuff that used to interest you, and lower mood. So depression, depress, everything's lower, right? So all of a sudden you don't have the energy. All of a sudden you, you like to go for walks. You used to like going for walks. Nowadays it, it doesn't really tempt you that much. Or you just feel down. You don't get as happy. The problem with this, it, it's, very, um, it's very subjective, isn't it? And if you're like me, I remember the day we got the diagnosis manual in our studies before our exam. That was a big day, right? Let, let's have a look at this book. And we flip the pages and we're like, oh shit, I have all of these. So it has to be for a certain amount of time and with a certain intensity, right? But the, it's still subjective. And um, just to give an example, Adi Ben a, uh, used to be part of the royal house. He was uh, married to our princess, one of our princesses. And... Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, isn't it, who's struggling? 
I listened to Lørdagsrådet, one of the biggest podcasts in Norway the other day, and I scrolled back because I've been listening to the most recent ones. I scrolled back to an episode from 2018 where he's a guest. And he sounds awesome, just fine. Robbie Williams, the same thing. People kept saying, oh, he always looks happy. He's always happy. And not too long later, they kill themselves, right? That, that's what happened. So I think if you commit suicide, it's fair to say you've been struggling. So it's hard. So that's depression. And uh, what brought people, at least to my clinic, was usually the secondary symptoms that you can also have which also uh, happen to revolve around cognitive functions. So people all of a sudden can't concentrate, can't remember. And they usually come and they're very concerned. They, they're concerned about some brain disease, like am I turning demented? Am I getting Alzheimer's? But it's usually something with depression and not something biological with your brain. And if we turn to anxiety, that, turns, that, that can have various shapes or forms. But you're, you're activated. You're responding to something as if it's a, a threat. It can be social phobia. It can be various phobias. Or it can be general anxiety, where you just feel alert a lot of the time. You'll have a physio physiological reaction. You'll feel alert, high pulse, sweat. And that turns into a behavioral one. You'll tend to avoid certain things. And that's when you really get into trouble, when you start avoiding certain things. Because then you'll never, f never feel uh, mastery, right? If you keep avoiding what you're afraid of. And of course, you have the fear and the cognitive stuff. You keep projecting, you keep fearing stuff, you keep imagining scary things. And this becomes a vicious cycle. So those are the most uh, common things accounting for most of the cases in the clinic as I've met and in the statistics. So, and then you have uh, a few more things that are common, especially in academia. Stress-related disorders, PTSD, not too common maybe, but at least burnout is a big talking point. And there are studies on this suggesting that the circumstances in your PhD will determine how much of a risk you have of developing burnout. For example, su supervision quality. How much supervision you're supposed to have as opposed to how much you have. Whether or not you have only one good supervisor or several, several of them. These are relevant factors that we'll get back to. And then we'll have a bunch of disorders that account for just a few percent in the population. So a few percent of all of us will have a, an eating disorder which, by the way, is more prevalent in sports. That's one of the things that's more prevalent in sports. Depression is lower prevalence. This is higher prevalence. Psychosis, schizophrenia, stuff like that, and bipolar. That's just some examples of smaller diseases, but the big ones, again, depression, anxiety. So I thought we would have a look at academia. What kind of a context is academia and what's unique? about doing a PhD, and I'm not talking about being a professor or have a permanent position, I'm talking about PhD postdoc. What's unique about this and what are the potential risk factors if we consider human needs? What do we need to thrive and perform well? I think first of all, it's relevant to consider how doing a PhD or a postdoc is filled with uncertainty. What's my aim? What's my research question? That may change. Will I have a job after this? It's kind of hard. And relatedly, another point, I think, is um, it's quite competitive. And I don't think it's fair competition because I think all of us can handle losing a fair competition. If you and I run, 100 meters, one-on-one, -on -one, and you beat me by two meters. I can live with that because it's fair, right? It's fair competition. We run on the same track, the same distance, and you're just faster. That's not the case in academia. What, what do we do in academia? We compete on publications and citations. 
So let's say I have two more publications or 200 more citations than you. Am I a better researcher than you? I don't think so. Depends on the field, right? You guys may be in a field where 20 citations is amazing. Or a field where you might expect 200 citations. And this totally depends on so many things. The quality of your supervision, the networking, name factors, the experience of the people you work with, some luck. If you were uh, collecting data during COVID like I did, depends on a bit of luck, timing, the rules and regulation, which might be different here, it might be different in also from here. I wouldn't say it's fair competition. And we're not too good at handling injustice, are we? When things are not fair. That's bugging us, isn't it? So I did, a, that's, that was a big part of one of the, like I said, I put things on YouTube. That was a big part of uh, my previous talk here, handling failure in academia. Because I think it's extremely hard to tell what is failure in academia. You can almost argue there is no failure in academia. It depends. So I think that's a, that's a risk factor in a sense. Leading people to stay up at night, can't sleep, and feel a sense of injustice. Uh, another factor is very high cognitive demand. Like I said, what brings people to the clinic is very often that they notice my brain is not functioning the way I'm used to. And academia is a context where you get punished for that very hardly, right? In the same sense, if you're a sprinter and you have a hamstring injury, you can't sprint max, you're not going to compete, right? If you're in academia and your brain is not functioning properly, you, you'll notice and you'll get punished in the sense of you, you won't be as productive as you could be. And of course, Work is not just work to most PhDs. It's not like we just go into the office at 8, we go home at 4, and we forget about it, and it's just our job. I've never heard a PhD say, it's just my job. It's just something I do for a living. It's part of your identity, right? A little bit part of who you are. So when, when it's unfair competition and it's really high demand, you're going to have a hard time if things are not rolling. And lastly, I was going to say support, but you might as well say lack of support. I've never met, again, I've never met a PhD who's actually happy about the level of support. I remember one of the first courses I did as a PhD. <laughs> we were presented with our demands. That's a very Norwegian word. Vi har krav. Du har krav på dette. We have demands. We can demand. And they gave us a ridiculous number for how many hours of supervision you guys can actually demand. And we were just looking at one another, is anyone getting this? Like, are you getting this many hours? No? The supervisors are always busy. They always have their own agenda. They always have their own research career. Nobody gets enough support. And that's another thing we're not too good at. We're not too good at handling that. And it can sometimes even be negative support. It can be a, a hostile climate or arguments and stuff. So, so that's my brief presentation on, on the challenge. And let's consider what can we do. And I very much look forward to our Q&A later. I hope you guys have some ideas as well. I just thought I would present some of my tips for you guys based on some research, my clinical experience, and also some convenience because some of these things are not too hard. In theory, if you want to increase your likelihood of either avoiding serious mental illness, maybe keeping it from going south, if you have a little bit of this, maybe you can keep it from going straight down the drain. Or if you're struggling, 
as I think most of uh, us will at some point, it, it can keep you from really struggling and maybe even improve, improve your well-being. So I'll start with the boring stuff. I call it the three boring basics. And I'll try not to fall asleep as I present these things. Um, but there are three things that you can do to uh, really increase your likelihood of having good mental health. If you do all of these three, I think you'll be golden. I think you'll be uh, in a really good position to have good mental health. If you do two out of three, I think you're going to be okay by a good likelihood. And if you don't do any of these, you probably won't have an effect of therapy. Or if you go to therapy and you don't do these, the first agenda for the psychologist will be, can you start doing these? And you may know what I mean. You may know the idea of what I'm going to present here. But first of all, eat. So if you're struggling with anxiety, for example, try eating something, wait 15 minutes, see how you feel. If you eat some proper food with fat. Speaking of which, should we do a refill? You guys want to get more pizza? Yeah. Let's do the occasion. <laughs> let's, let's take my advice and get some more pizza. And we'll start again in two minutes. So, now that we have uh, increased our chance of success, let's do the next boring basic, which you've uh, probably guessed already. Sleep. And you guys know it's easier to concentrate if you've slept well and you know all the studies on the health. So I'll just present you with a, a new finding, some new research. Sleep turns out to be crucial for learning what you've already focused on. Sleep turns out to be important for consolidation of memories, the transportation of me the, the process of getting information from perception to the consolidation to the long-term memory so you actually have learned it for a long time. If you don't sleep well, this process will be shattered. And they've done brain scans on what goes on in your brain when you're asleep, and it mimics the brain activity when you're awake. So in other words, it rehearses. Your brain rehearses when you're asleep, which is mind-blowing to me that my brain is doing that when I'm asleep. Which is rather new, so I didn't know that, and I think it's one of the, one of the better arguments for, especially athletes. They, ke they keep hearing, you gotta go to bed early, you gotta sleep. Ah, I don't wanna do that. Well, you wanna improve, right? You wanna become great? Okay, you need to sleep. Because that's when your brain process information and learn. The last one, Exercise. And it doesn't matter what you do. If you lift weights, if you go for a fast walk, if you run. In addition to all the physical stuff, you get a mental break. My PhD is on uh, rowers. I study uh, Olympic level rowers and some lower level rowers. And I do psychophysiological testing on them. And I just keep talking to them because I don't get how people can do rowing. Because it, it's so boring, and it's repetitive, and it's very painful. Have you ever tried the, the ergometer? Like to really go fast on the ergometer? It's super painful. And I was like, why do you do that to yourself? And one of the guys was like, because when I do that, my brain is occupied, and I can't do all the worrying that I normally do. You get a break. Or if you play football, it's, it's so fast. You need to consider things. You don't have time for all your worries. It's a break. It's a 45-minute break. It's a 30-minute break. It's a 10-minute break. If you, if you don't exercise at all, and you start doing 10 minutes, I think, of exercise each day, you'll increase your longevity. Because the difference between doing nothing and something is always the greatest, right? When you start to do more and more, you need to do more and more to improve. But if you do nothing, if you start doing something, that's awesome. So that was the three boring basics. 
So let's turn to academia. And if you uh, want to consider what should I do or what's the remedy, I think it always helps to start with the problem. And again, I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the Q&A. But if you want to have better mental health in academia, I think it makes sense to start looking at what, what are the risk factors? What's the problem here? And I think, first of all, uncertainty. Well, if you want me better mental health in academia, you, you need to have some sense of certainty. Because you're not going to get it from the environment itself. That means you'll have to go and achieve it. You'll need to make sure that you know what to do or at least have some plan on what to do. Autonomy. A sense of knowing what's my plan, what are my goals. And the same thing with unfair competition. And we could get into more specifics in the Q&A. But this is also something I touched on in a previous talk because I think the best, the most fair competition in sports and academia is you against you. To set goals for yourself based on your process, based on where you want to go, and based on your knowledge of what am I like when I'm at my best, when I'm focused, when I'm doing my job, when I'm learning new things, when I'm creative, and what am I like when I'm not so good, when I'm procrastinating, when I'm lazy. And if you can make a list of both, you can set up a competition called Me Against Me. And you can go into every day and try to be the better version of you. And by the end of the day, you can tally the score and you can decide for yourself, was, it, was this a, a win or a loss? And you're never supposed to have two losses in a row. Everyone can lose to themselves every now and then, but then you bounce back. You go into the next day determined to do better than you did yesterday. That's a competition most people can handle. People can handle losing fair competition where they know the criteria and it's a realistic competitor. That's another benefit of doing that as opposed to what people tend to do, if, especially if they're uh, depressed, comparing to everyone else, especially via social, social media, which of course gives you a very accurate view of how other people are actually doing, right? Or even, uh, I don't know how many of you do coding. I learned how to code two years ago. And people put it up on GitHub, right? It's a platform where you put up your code, if you're brave. And we had a seminar and someone said, Ah, I don't want to put up my code there. Oh, really? Why not? No, it's, it's so bad. So people only put up the good code. So everyone thinks that everyone else is great at coding. Which is why I determined right there and then, I'm going to put up my code no matter what. And I have the worst code in the world up on my profile. It's very hard to set up a fair competition. High cognitive demand. This is something that we covered in our previous seminar. Load management. You cannot do the full day, eight hours in academia, work hard, high cognitive load, super intense. You'll get burned out. Some scholars said each of us have approximately three hours of high, lo high load cognitive work in us for a day. I don't know if that's true. Maybe some of you have four hours. Maybe some of you have two. All I know is that you cannot do eight hours of high intense, high intensity cognitive work. So you need a plan for load. And lastly, seek support. Again, there are studies on this. There's a real benefit to having more than one supervisor. And you can also even approach people and ask for support if you need some help on specifics, but also just social support, emotional support. And I'll get back to that in a bit. My, my last slide is on personal responsibility and development. It would be really bad if there's nothing we can do about stress 
for example. So I, I want to show one thing, which is research starting in the 70s by Susan Kubasa. At that point in time, stress was something really bad. When people got hospitalized with, with burnout, whatever, people just said, oh, they're too stressed. There's nothing people can do when the stress level increases to a certain amount. And she was like starting her research on personality. And she started to study uh, leaders in uh, uh, middle-sized organizations up to big organizations, IBM, uh, can't remember, big corporations in the United States. And she realized how people handle stress is different from person to person. Some people that she studied got sick, uh, burnouts, poor performance. Some people handle it okay. And there were actually people handling stress quite well, which is, of course, what we strive for in sports. Everyone's going to be stressed in the Olympic final. We're looking for the person that can handle it and prepare for it and thrive, even though it's pressure. So this model has become very popular. First of all, commitment. She noticed that, that the people handling stress the, the best, they were the ones showing commitment. They didn't just give up. If you just give up at the first setback in academia, you're going to have a really hard time. The next thing she noticed is that they actually embraced the challenge. And again, I would say, if you like things to be easy, Academia is not for you. And the last thing which I started this slide with is that she saw a sense of control, a sense of responsibility. Instead of blaming everyone else, instead of focusing on all the factors that are outside of your control, the system, these people were able to focus on what they could actually control and take responsibility for themselves. Okay, so I just want to finish off on a very specific note. Because you guys actually, because you live in Norway and because you are in uh, academia, the public sector, and because you are bright people, you guys have uh, some options that some other people in the world don't have. And the first option, if you guys want to focus on your mental health, either prevent going into a bad place or maybe you are in a bad place and you want to get out, first of all, talk to someone. And you probably know this, but for example, at OS, you have uh, free services. You have free people to talk to. And here's the good news. It doesn't matter who it is you talk to, which is a bummer for me. Because I've spent six years of my life training to be a psychologist, learning therapeutic technique. And all the studies on success in therapy suggests that about 50% or, or the biggest portion of the variance is explained by the alliance and the trust between two people. And a very, very small percentage is explained by therapeutic technique. But of course, I mean, if you go to see a psychologist, I feel like I have to advertise for my profession. Like, <laughs> chances are you'll meet someone with a interest in other people and a degree and a certain personal quality or something but it can be it can be a priest it can be anyone the 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 the, the downside to going to a friend or your family your mother whatever is that they tend to have their own agenda they tend to say the things that they give you the advice that they want you to take if you go to see someone neutral they'll start from scratch and hopefully consider you from a neutral standpoint. That's the benefit. And uh, not even at all, so you have mental health. Again, free, free chat, free stuff. Uh, the second tip is write to someone or no one. People that write about their problems improve their mental health as compared to people who don't write about their problems. For example, in a diary. And I, I tend to give this example. Uh, I meet people who struggle with something. Try, try to just, first of all, write down a list. What's your problems? 
What are you thinking of? And then you can divide it into to, uh, two sections, the stuff you cannot control. And that list tends to be long because we tend to worry about stuff we cannot control that much. And then you can create a small like to-do list, whatever, what can you actually do? So it can look like this. It's super simple. And even the, the left column, if you just write down your problems, at least you have it on paper, you have it in front of you. When you write, you think. So you have to process stuff. And it's free. And the, the final tip that I would uh, mention is that uh, listen to someone. You have seminars, you have um, free lectures, you have stuff online. I thought I would just mention a few podcasts since this is a uh, industry or field that I'm going into now. You have, uh, you have podcasts trying to raise awareness uh, around mental health uh, in the population, but also in men. Because I forgot to say that women are overrepresented in, uh, in the statistics when it comes to mental disease. But the problem is, are there some numbers we're not getting here? Like, are we good at getting the problems and the expression in men? Could it be that men are better at hiding stuff or expressing it in a different way? So you have stuff like this. Uh, we're on Heart of the Mom. If you're uh, understanding Norwegian, I'm sure there are many examples in English as well. And I, I just thought I would mention my own podcast now, where we try to invite athletes to open up about their experience. And we've had um, professional football players telling us they've been seeing psychologists for years. One guy said he was bullied when he was young and he, he was having depression in his teenage years, how he got through it. And we hope that this can help because in Football Huda, we meet people who actually perform well and they seem kind of tough, but they actually struggle. So you can talk to someone, write to someone or no one, or, or listen to someone. And some summary of this would be, uh, first of all, remember that thoughts and feelings are common, even if they're negative. And it's actually quite adaptive to feel negative stuff. We're not supposed to walk around feeling happy all the time. Because then we would be open to all the predators. If we were walking up to the lion and patting his head saying, are you nice? We're supposed to be a little anxious. We're supposed to be down sometimes. But if you have it for a long time, you should seek help, probably. Or do the preventive stuff before it becomes too bad. And uh, feel free to seek help. The three boring basics. If you eat, sleep, and exercise. And uh, let's have a discussion on this in the Q&A, what you can actually do in, in academia, just attacking the, the risk factors and maybe going after the stuff that you need. If you have a lack of support, for example, how can you increase your support? I think we have a responsibility for ourselves. And I think that's the main message for me, is that the good news is that we can actually have a say in the matter. There's stuff we can do. So before we turn to Q&A, I would say thank you for your attention.